Well, I am here once again, much to my great pleasure, with Massimo <laughs> Piliucci. Uh, and um, before we get started, Massimo, why don't you introduce yourself and I will do the same. Uh, Massimo Piliucci, I'm the KD Irani Professor of Philosophy at City College of New York, and you will notice my brand new earphones of, uh, you know, orangey reddish color. Yeah, they're very, uh, they're not hard to see. Um, I'm Daniel Kaufman, and I am a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University. So Massimo, in keeping with our noble efforts to try and keep the public informed on what is going on within the, uh, the world of philosophy, I thought that maybe this time we could talk about a very specific philosophical issue, and one that really is at the heart uh, of the discipline. It's a subject that every person who uh, takes undergraduate courses in philosophy will encounter, and that's the topic of skepticism. Are you game for that? Sure, let's go ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, first of all, why don't we just start off with a little definition. How do you, as a professor who teaches undergraduates, and I know you've also, you teach introductory level courses, um, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you define skepticism for your students? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, as you know, there are different varieties and different, different flavors, right? We, we can go either all the way back to the, to the uh, ancient Greek skeptics, uh, which is, of course, where the, the term comes from to begin with. Uh, or you can go to more, more modern time, uh, you know, early modern philosophers like David Hume, for instance. Uh, and then there is you know, the current meanings of the term, both within and outside of philosophy. Uh, there is, as you know, an entire uh, uh, self-professed skeptic community, which uh, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with skepticism in the philosophical sense, although sometimes those people actually think that they do. So, um, so I give my students a sort of an overview of these things. And I say, look, uh, you, can, you can be also skeptical. Uh, not only skepticism itself has different meanings, uh, ranging from sort of radical epistemological skepticism like you know the, you, you don't re, we don't really know anything you know sort of purism or you cannot uh, actually claim to do to know anything um, to uh, more mild varieties uh, and to uh, types of skepticism that actually focused on specific issues so you can be skeptic about uh, let's say moral facts uh, but not about empirical facts or less so about empirical facts so it's it's uh, I tend to give him this sort of overview of both the different type of skepticism as well as the different uh, domains of inquiry to which you can apply skepticism what, what about you I mean I'm sure you do the well, same thing yeah so so what I usually do is I mean I do say something about the ancient Greek version um, although it's not the one that I generally teach um, when I do skepticism I generally teach Descartes and Hume and I generally um, present the skeptic as uh, not just challenging whether we know something, but challenging the grounds on which we claim to know things. Right. Um, and I treat, I, I, I treat the skeptic as uh, an internal rather than an external challenge. So uh, Robert Nozick uh, in his book, Philosophical Explanations, has this wonderful metaphor where he distinguishes between uh, dealing with the skeptic through one's Bureau of International Relations versus <laughs> versus dealing with the skeptic uh, with through our uh, Department of the Interior. There you go. <laughs> uh, and he says that we should deal with the skeptic through our Department of the Interior because if you treat the skeptic as sort of an enemy, an external enemy, he's very easy to dismiss. Right. Um, you can simply say, well, you know, uh, you claim that we don't we don't have any justification for the things that we believe, but that itself is a claim for which, therefore, you can have no justification, and therefore, I don't have to listen to you, right. and then we don't learn anything. Um, and the and the aim of engaging the skeptic, I think, is to learn something. Uh, this is also part of the reason why I don't teach the ancient Greek skeptics, because the ancient Greek skeptics, to a large extent. Uh, took the skepticism uh, literally in the sense that they really thought that if you couldn't find justifications uh, for these beliefs, that you ought to suspend belief. Right. And, um, and A, this will probably come out later, I don't think that's really possible. Uh, but B, I think it's to misunderstand the real uh, intellectual value to be gained by engaging, engaging with the question. Well, I would agree, I except for, let me make a comment about the ancient, yeah, the ancient Greeks for a second. So, no, I, I think you're right. I mean, that's sort of definitely a, a good way to go about it. Uh, the reason I do start with, with the Greeks, however, other than sort of historical, I, I do think that, uh, that an historical perspective is a good idea in, in any field of inquiry, uh, uh, certainly philosophy, but, but also the science in general. But because there is a, there is a thing, so what you can show is sort of the evolution of skepticism 
mm. uh, through time, right? So as you just said, in fact, uh, one of the maddening things about the ancient Greek skeptics is that they were skeptics about everything. And it was like, you know, it was the kind of skepticism today is very easy to dismiss, as you were saying. Right. Um, and yet, uh, they actually had an influence on other schools, for instance, uh, the Stoics. Uh, the Stoics actually had a very different take on, on knowledge. They thought that uh, they needed to develop in epist what we will call today an epistemology, you know, a theory of knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, because although their main concern, uh, as we talked in another episode of our little chats, uh, the main concern of the Stoics was uh, sort of ethics, it was about, you know, how to, to live the, the good life. They, they thought that... Uh, uh, you cannot actually figure out how to live a good life until you understand, A, how the world works, hence their so-called physics, which was really natural science and, and metaphysics. And also, unless you understand how human beings reason and fail to reason, hence their interest in logic and epistemology. Now, the skeptics were among the chief uh, uh, opponents and the chief critics of the Stoics, uh, as you might imagine, because, because the Stoics were making claims about uh, about knowledge that were far too uh, 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 sort of uh, strong for for a skeptical perspective, and what happened over time is that the Stoics listened. Uh, you know, they said, "Well, okay, you guys have a point, but you know, I don't want to go all the way to on on the other side of the spectrum and become a skeptic because I don't think, in fact, it's a it's a particularly useful, pragmatically useful uh, approach to things." And the Stoics were very uh, pragmatic, very much into something that you could practice. But they did, they did listen and they, do, they did change. So the late Stoics uh, had modified their doctrines in response, directly response to the Stoics, uh, sorry, to the skeptics. So I do think that there is a, even the original skepticism, as radical as it may sound, or as uh, uninteresting from modern perspective as it may sound, actually does have a purpose, did have a purpose, because it did influence other ways of thinking and, and sort of you, you bring... Um, I think, I think in general, the idea, one of the best things about skepticism uh, is that it forces you into a sort of a continuous process of reflective equilibrium, as, uh, as Rawls mm. would put it, right? So as in, okay, I think I'm sure about this, or I think I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably confident about this, but, but then I take the, spe the, the skeptic perspective in, in, into account, and all of a sudden, I actually need to, to deal with the fact that uh, my, my certainty or my confidence might not be... Uh, just as warranted as as I thought. Yeah, no, I I agree with that. And actually, I would I would I, you know go a little further with it, and that is, you know, one of the things I tell my students about Descartes, um, who probably of all the of all the sort of the, the skepticisms that undergraduates will encounter, probably the skeptical uh, arguments that Descartes presents in the first meditation of the meditations of the first philosophy is probably the ones that they will most likely encounter. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what I tell students is that. You know, it's 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 really um, remarkable and important that Descartes did this precisely because he was part of the vanguard of the scientific revolution, right. and um, uh, and one of the th one of the things that the scientific revolution was about was trying to um, argue for a fundamentally different approach to how we know things. Um, that is, the prior model of how we know things is that we know things on the basis of authority. We know right. things uh, either because uh, people in positions of authority told you or because certain texts that carry certain authorities uh, tell you. Right. And, of course, the whole premise of science is that, um, uh, that, that our belief should be based on, uh, on uh, rational reasons, uh, not, on, not on authorities. But I think one of the things that Descartes saw was that science itself could easily become an, a kind of authority, which is why, if you notice in the first meditation, the kinds of beliefs that he's challenging, the kind of uh, rationales or justifications that he's challenging are precisely the sorts of rationales that we give in uh, the sciences. And that is beliefs that are based uh, on observation right. and beliefs that are based uh, in reason, whether deductive or inductive. And so I think that Descartes himself was very, was very uh, intellectually honest and was as concerned about uh, appeals to uh, scientific reasons becoming a new kind of dogmatism uh, as he was about uh, challenging the, the dogmatism of the, uh, of, the, of the medieval culture that, he, uh, that the science of a revolution was reacting right. to. I mean, the, 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 part, the interesting thing, one of the interesting things I should say about, about Descartes <coughs> is precisely that he was at the cusp between, on the one hand, 
uh, the scholasticism in which he was still very much immersed. I mean, he, he was very familiar with scholastic That's texts right. and, you know, and, and medieval logic and, and things like that. And of course, Aristotelianism uh, as, as he got it from the scholastics and on the one hand. And on the other hand, as you said, it was, it was poised right at the beginning of the, uh, of the uh, scientific revolution. And, you know, he was a contemporary of Galileo. Uh, so, so it was right at the moment where things started happening for, for what at the time was natural science and then, then became what we consider today science. So, so he was a crucial figure and, and this idea, besides this idea, of course, that of sort of engaging at least once, uh, in your life in a, in a radical doubt, uh, sort of situation, uh, exercise, uh, I think it's, it's a, it's very appealing to the students. It's, it's one of those things that you, you know, they read them and once they get in, uh, uh, it's, it's something that they can relate to. Um, it's a classic thought experiment in philosophy. Uh, of course it can be explained with using science fiction very easily. You know, it, it immediately right. brings to mind the matrix and things like that. Um, so, and it does of course lead immediately to question things that apparently are, uh, are so solid as to be unquestionable, right? I mean, uh, is there really a, an evil demon or uh, sort of a matrix uh, generated by computers so that such that the, the entirety of what we think of as reality is actually not there. And the, 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 far, the thought strikes you immediately the first time as ludicrous. Yeah. And then you start thinking about it and you say, yeah, but how do I know that that's not the case? And the more you think about it, the more you actually realize that now you don't know that it is, that it's not the case. Right. Uh, it's or better or better at you see that the reasons you have for thinking that you're not are equally consistent right. with you being in the matrix. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and, and right. In other words, you know, that's one of the things that's so strong about, about some of those arguments is that they show you that, um, that the, the evidence that you that you appeal to the reasons that you appeal to um uh are 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 equally point in a very different direction right uh and then beg the that, that then begs the question then why do you believe a rather than b given that the evidence points equally either way and that's a that that that's a much more difficult thing to dismiss than whether there are malicious demons or not in other words one of the things i try to point out to my students is that the exotica of the examples can be entirely dispensed with, right? Uh, and you can simply make the point um, um, uh, as a matter of uh, 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 hypotheses being underdetermined by the data, so to speak. Um, that uh, that 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 these reasons we give don't only point in one direction, uh, and and we and we have to be very careful uh, about when we give reasons uh, uh, about paying attention to the directions in which they point, and uh, not not assuming that our reasons give us more uh, specificity than we think they do. That, that's it's entirely correct. Now, the problem, of course, when you then you start with Descartes, I mean, I, eventually, I, I hope we're going to move, move to Hume. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Descartes, you know, the, 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 the issue with Descartes that I also like to point out uh, to, to the students, because I think it is very, very interesting in general, is, is that he has this these intellectual courage of, of jumping into this uh, abyss of, of radical doubt. Uh, but then he sees that he has somehow to get out of it, and he does not really have a good way to get out of it. I mean, you know, uh, uh, yeah. at some point, you know, pretty pretty soon, he has to invoke a god who doesn't deceive, uh, which, depending on how you look at it, uh, is referred to as either the the, the Cartesian circle or the Cartesian yeah. vicious circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Either way, he just he just can't get out of it, and. Um, and, and we as moderns, uh, uh, you know, later on with sort of a more sophisticated understanding perhaps of, of logic and epistemology, see clearly why he cannot. I mean, he's, he's set a, a very good uh, uh, thought experiment such that he, he makes probably his points better than he even self thought he was going was gonna to make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and, and we, I hope we, we will get to this. I, I actually suspect you and I may, may disagree on this. Um, um, which is which is good because yeah. some people have been complaining that you and I agree too much. I know, right? <laughs> um, which actually is totally untrue. They, they it people is. People realize that you and I fight viciously behind the scenes. Exactly. If they, if um, they only had access to our emails, they will know. That's right. That's right. Um, okay. So so let's maybe talk a little bit about very quickly about the varieties of skepticism, and then we can, um, I'm sure, because of the, because of that, we'll get to Hume immediately. Um, um, how do you picture the varieties of skepticism? And then maybe I'll, I'll say something about how I do, and then we can proceed from there. Uh, 
You mean in terms do, 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 do you generally view them topic specifically skepticism ah. about this, or do you view them in terms of global versus specific? I, I try to do it actually both, so, so both ways. So, so on okay. the one hand, uh, we, we usually discuss skepticism as a general approach and so a general problem in epistemology, as a, a general issue about knowing anything. Period. Um, and then you be you get more specific and you say, okay, but. Uh, could there be different types of skepticism or different or maybe the, the skeptic argument has different uh, levels of force let's say uh, if applied to different things uh, so for instance you know let's go back for a minute to to Descartes I mean Descartes did say that not only he wasn't sure that the evil the, 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 the evil demon was uh, uh, wasn't tricking him when it came to his senses, right? There's this wonderful image of him being in front of the fireplace and asking yeah. himself, you know, what do I know that I am actually myself in front of the fireplace as opposed to perhaps, you know, this is all a dream that is conjured, you know, a very vivid dream that is conjured by, by the demon. And after all, we do know, we do uh, occasionally experience dreams that are so vivid or nightmares that are so vivid that they do fool us for, for a brief period into thinking that they're physical reality. So, that was one one type of sort of one skepticism about the physical world, but he expanded it to even skepticism about mathematics, right? He yeah, says, so yeah, so there are right. there are certain things you know I I can be I, I usually tell myself that I am absolutely sure that you know two plus two equals four or that you know the square root of nine is three. This is not the cards example, um, and yet even there, in fact, I could be mistaken because in fact it has happened that I look at a mathematical proof, let's say. Uh, or a mathematical concept, and then and I and I mistake, uh, I make a mistake, I make a, a, a an error in the calculation or in the proof, and it turns out that I was sure of something, and then it turned, it was not actually the case. Now, do you think that those are actually uh, skepticism of the same type? Because I tend to think that it's much more difficult actually to be skeptical of mathematical truths than empirical truths. Although I should immediately add, that's because I actually don't think that mathematical truths are anything like empirical truths, meaning they're not truths about the, the world out there. They're, they're sort of issues of, self, of logical self-consistency uh, without, without necessarily getting into the ontology of mathematics here. Yeah. But so, yeah, what, well, what's your take about so empirical versus mathematical or logical well, truth? Yeah, look, I, I agree with you that mathematics is not empirical. Um, I do think, however, that the broad um, the broad logic of the of the um, of the two types of doubt are the same, and you know, Hume Hume expresses the same kind of doubt. He's got one chapter in the treatise called Skepticism with regard to the senses, and he has right. another chapter entitled Skepticism with regard to reason, right. and he makes very similar types of observations that Descartes makes. He doesn't invoke an evil gene, demon and stuff like this, but he does point out uh, he does make a very very similar uh, points, and I think that. Um, the, the similarity is that both of them stem from a very real uh, fact about us, and that is that both our sensory and our reasoning uh, faculties are fallible. Right. Um, and so, and and I think really that that all of the skeptical arguments ultimately are based on that very real fact about us, um, and about the further fact that there is some puzzle as to how one can increase one's confidence in the reliability of those faculties without using the very same faculties right. that one is currently doubting. So Hume has this famous thing in skepticism with regard to reason. He says, look, you know, even when we do deductions, ultimately the, re the reliability of those deductions is probabilistic because yes, the deductions themselves are not based on probabilistic reasoning, but whether or not I'm reasoning correctly is probabilistic, <laughs> uh, right? Yeah. And how can I then uh, ensure to myself that I am reasoning correctly other than by doing more reasoning, right? right? The problem is that every time I do more reasoning, actually the, the probability of me my making a mistake increases, right? Um, and so um, I, I do think that broadly speaking, the logic of the two types of skepticism is the same mm -hmm. uh, right. in, that it, in that it's based on the recognition that our senses are fallible and there's really our, our faculties are fallible and there is no way to confirm or check whether the fact our faculties are working correctly at any particular moment without simply employing those faculties more. That's right. No, I, I completely agree. Now, now the issue, however, as far as Descartes specifically is concerned, uh, is that uh, he was, uh, arguably, he was the last great philosopher to try out uh, or to test to the extreme, I suppose, 
uh, what is sometimes referred to as the rationalist approach to knowledge, right? That, that goes all the way back to Plato and probably some of the pre-Socratics, as opposed to the empiricist approach to knowledge. That's, that's why at some point we will switch to Hume to, to, because we're going to take on the empiricist as, as well. Uh, yeah. But in terms of the rationalists, right? So the, the, the issue, one of the reasons Descartes feels, uh, with all due respect, but he feels quaint from, uh, from the point of view of a modern scientific mind Right, is because he was trying to establish certain knowledge. Uh, he was, he was, he was trying to say, well, there is a way that we can just think our way through this uh, yes. on rational grounds. Uh, you know, despite the fact that we know that the that the senses are are fallible, despite the fact that we know that we can make mistakes and so on and so forth, we can we can derive some fundamental knowledge about the world uh, from just thinking about it. Which, of course, was uh, the quintessential Platonic project. Uh, uh, as opposed to, let's say, the Aristotelian project. Aristotle was very much into sort of empirical, practical investigations. You know, he, he spent time on the island of Lesbo just looking at shells to figure out how they worked. Um, so the rationalist program, I think it's fair to say, had its, its, its last and probably greatest champion after, after Plato in Descartes. I mean, after that, it sort of becomes untenable to try to do that sort of stuff. And so I think that in some sense, one way to read Descartes is that his uh, courageous intellectual um, in intellect uh, really made clear that what he wanted to do was actually not possible. Um, and, you know, even though that sounds like a sort of a negative, I mean, it is a negative conclusion. It doesn't just sound like it. <laughs> it is. Um, I still think that makes him one of the greatest philosophers of all time. Yeah. Uh, you know, j just arriving to that point and, and, and showing to the rest of the world that, you know, here is why this thing doesn't work. Uh, it's a it's a, it's a great it's a great accomplishment. Now you 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 uh, then um, uh, jump forward to uh, to David Hume, who on the other hand, of course, was an empiricist, not 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 at all in the rationalist tradition. Uh, then things change dramatically. But as you pointed out a minute ago, it's essentially the same point. Now, however, uh, more concerned with 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 the empirical sciences, even though Hume does talk about relations of ideas as well. You know about, about deductive logic and so on but he's really because i mean he's most famous for for the so-called problem of induction for instance which if taken yes. seriously is a serious serious way to undermine everything that we know uh not just in science but it's sort of common sense um so so how do you present uh hume to your to your students then well i mean you know you, you mentioned the problem of induction we, we probably should say what, what the, yes how, that, how, how about how that, that goes, <laughs> right sure so so um the idea is that you know all inductive reasoning um, in inductive reasoning, what we do is we make inferences about uh, how things will be in the future based on how they've been in the past. Right. And um, of course, this is the basic me method of reasoning that we primarily employ in the natural that we, in the natural sciences, and as well as in ordinary life and daily life. Um, and um, uh, as Hume points out. Um, the inference uh, inferences uh, as to the how things will be in the future on the basis of how they were in the past uh, rely on a very large assumption and that is that um, nature uh, exhibits a certain uniformity right um, that is that uh, that it is the case that uh, the way things were in the past is the way that they're generally going to be in the future and Hume then asks well what's our basis for thinking that um, and uh, as should be very uh, evident if you think about it for a few minutes that is not something that can be known empirically right, right. because empirical knowledge rests upon uh, the capacity to uh, 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 legitimately reason inductively uh, and it also cannot be uh, demonstrated deductively uh, that is it does not follow as a deductive matter from the fact that something is the case today that it will be the case tomorrow that's right um, and so what Hume should basically showed is uh, that at least from the standpoint of any sort of rational justification, our practice of indu induction, inductive reasoning is not justified. Um, and um, he also makes, you know, he also is very famous for his skepticism about causation. Right. He's famous for his skepticism about personal identity. Uh, I don't know that we need, we need to go into the details of all of these. No, probably um, not. Um, but, but what yeah, you, yeah. you were just saying uh, uh, remind me of something that, that perhaps is going to bring us on, on a tangent, but it may be an interesting tangent. Uh, so, so there is a, uh, your, so your, your description of, of Hume, of course, is, is right on target. Now, the, the, the issue you mentioned, both causality and so this assumption, underlying assumption that things don't change, in other words, uniformity of nature. Uh, now, there is a, um, 
an interesting book that I'm re I've been reading recently. Uh, it's it's a long it's a long one. It's actually fairly complicated, <laughs> and so I'm taking my time. But nonetheless, it actually speaks uh, more or less directly to both of those topics. Uh, the book in question is called "The Singular Universe and the Reality of Time," by uh, Roberto Unger and Lee Smolin. And uh, so Unger is a philosopher. Uh, Smolin is a physicist. And uh, uh, right there, by the way, I, I, I like the idea of the book, even though I may or may not buy it, sort of their major conclusions. But I like the idea of the book because I like this, this idea that uh, philosophers and, and, and scientists are getting together uh, to explore some really interesting issues at the borderline between the two disciplines. In fact, the, the entire book uh, is, uh, is actually split in two. The first half is written by Unger from a philosophical perspective. And the second part makes exactly the same arguments, but it's written by Smolin from a scientific perspective. That's really interesting. Yeah, it, it really is. And um, so I'm going to slowly through this. I mean, I don't want to turn this, this episode into a, a review of the book. Maybe we should do that separately if, if you're uh, willing to actually read the book. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but the reason I, I brought it up is because um, of both causality and uniformity of nature. So, um, the project that Hunger and Smolin, uh, Smolin have is rather iconoclastic in, in modern science. Um, what, they're, what they're proposing is that time uh, is fundamental. It's not an emergent property of anything. Uh, so it's a, it's a brute fact, basically, about the world, that there is only one universe. In other words, they, they uh, discard the idea of the multiverse as essentially nothing more than a mathematical fiction. Um, and they do that, they arrive at that by a variety of, of sort of uh, paths, but one of them is that they think, they, they suggest that causality is actually fundamental, uh, fun, the fundamental process or fundamental aspect of reality from which everything else follows, and that the so-called regularity of nature, in other words, the laws, you know, what physicists refer to as laws of nature, um, are actually the result of causal interactions and not the other way around. I mean, typically in physics, uh, you explain, you causally explain phenomena by invoking these these timeless laws of nature. So, so you know, a certain particular thing happens because of the law of you know Newton's laws of motion, or because of right. something else, or or or, or other. Uh, according to so, so Smolin and, and Unger, basically turned the whole thing. They flip it around. They say, well, what this this talk about. Uh, universal, unchangeable, time invariant uh, laws is is you know uh, ontologically suspect. Where what are what are these things? Where, where do they come from? And uh, they think that instead it's the other way around. That is that causality is foundational, and then because causality makes it so that broadly speaking, and with some certain important exceptions, things do tend to go uh, pretty much always in the same way. Then we sort of infer the laws by induction, hmm. but that there is nothing more than that to the existence of the laws. And their main point, uh, uh, sort of to, to argue this, is that uh, the universe actually has gone through at least one instance during the, during the Big Bang, uh, in a, during and immediately after the Big Bang. Uh, uh, it has gone through a situation where, in fact, there were no laws of nature in the sense in which we understand them. Um, they were not actually uh, uh, active because the whole thing was in turmoil. The temperature of the universe was so high that the causal interactions were very different, and they were not describable by any of the current uh, laws. So, it's an it's a really interesting take on on it. And basically, the reason I brought it up again is because it makes causality, for which uh, you know of which, of course, David Hume was very skeptical in some sense. It makes it a, a more central, and by way of doing so. It also allows us to give it to take a, a you know get a different interpretation of the uniformity of nature. The uniformity of nature now is yeah. a result of causation as opposed to an assumption. Yeah, so it's, yeah, I like you know. that. I like that. I like that. The idea that um, regularity is a feature of causality. Causality is not a feature of regularity. Exactly. Right? I mean that that's exactly. It also it also makes a mess out of any the theistic attempts to try and say that there had to be a, you know, a first, a first cause. cause. That's right. <laughs> it totally makes a mess of, of that sort of exactly. thing. Somebody, next, next time you uh, meet William Lane Craig, you can throw that against him. Uh, That's right. Uh, I could say, by the way, did you read Hunger and Smaller? Uh, because, right. you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, let me ask you, you know, do you, do you think that there are, 
do you think that there are solutions to uh, there's two things I want to ask one is the, are there solutions to skept these skeptical arguments and B as a side issue do you do we need solutions to the skeptical arguments ah. uh, I, well I, I'm, I'd like to hear your answer but my answer is no there is no solution to the skeptical answer and therefore the second question is irrelevant <laughs> we can't get solutions so I don't know but I don't think that we need them actually so and the, the reason for that is because look as you know Many, many people, very, very, very bright people have tried uh, to sort of give answers to the skeptical argument. And as far as I can tell, they pretty much all failed for different reasons and, in, and sometimes in very interesting ways. Because, again, I, I do hold to this concept that philosophy uh, makes progress by elimination of bad ideas uh, or, or refinement of alternative ideas that are, however, equally equally uh, viable. So the fact that, mm. that we have a number of... Uh, uh, solutions, failed solutions to the skeptic challenge is not, uh, is not uh, uh, a cause for despair. In fact, we learned a lot, I think, uh, through, yeah. those, through those solutions, right? Now, uh, but, but as far as I can tell, they, they pretty much all failed. And now you can always make the argument, of course, yes, but that's because, you know, the next Descartes hasn't been born yet. Well, possibly. <laughs> that's, that's certainly a, a possibility. Um, but I, frankly, I'm a little skeptical of it. I, I think that if uh, if some nobody's been able to find an answer to a, to a, what essentially is a, a logical puzzle, not an empirical one, uh, for 2,400 years or so, uh, I I'm really reasonably skeptical that it's going to ever be found. Now that said, do we uh, care? I think we should care. Uh, should we be bothered by it? Uh, only in a very specific sense. I, I think that the value of the skeptic challenge, the skeptical challenge is that it constantly reminds us of just how little confidence we should have in our so-called certainties and our so-called discoveries and so on and so forth. Uh, that is not to say, and in fact, David Hume was very clear about this, that is not to say that all of a sudden we should therefore abandon common sense and science and start living in, in a world where, you know, we really act as if we didn't know anything. Uh, that would be not practical and that would be unwarranted, in fact. Uh, it would be impossible to to live in that in that sort of world. We have to work to work as if uh, we had reasonable confidence in the kinds of things that we think we're confident of. But from time to time, going back and reading Descartes, or going back and reading Hume, or even going back and reading the original, you know, the ancient uh, skeptics, I think it's a tonic for the rational soul. It is a a check on hubris. It is something that say, you know what, if somebody really pushed me, I really wouldn't have a good substantive answer, unassailable answer to why am I so damn confident about X, Z, or Y. Um, you know, of course, with respect to what you just said about Hume, um, that um, despite the fact that he developed some of the most potent skeptical arguments, he did not um, counsel uh being a skeptic Correct. in the sense of he did not counsel you you do realize that descartes says exactly the same yeah. thing uh in the discourse on method he says exactly the same thing he says uh when we act we have to act as if we are certain right um otherwise we lead to paralysis and i actually i do think you know if we had hours and hours i, I would debate you a little bit on this i actually think that the whole dividing of empiricism empiricists and rationalists is a mess <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I think De, I think Descartes and John Locke are much closer to each other than either is to Hume, um, oh. um, I, uh, uh, because both embrace the theory of ideas, right. um, uh, as it's called. And Hume is very uh, he starts with it, but he winds up ending very skeptically with it. So I mean, I, I would actually reorient the whole the whole way we teach history, uh, the history of Enlightenment differently. Um, but on this particular point, um, I, I I I do think we probably disagree a little bit. Um, let me just push you a little bit, ask you a little bit. Do you think that our inability to, um, and our inability to at least uh, see a way out of the skeptical challenge, does it make any sort of a mess out of our conception of rational justification of warrant? The, the idea, the idea of distinguishing beliefs that are rationally justified from beliefs that are not. Um, well, the, let, let's see what you mean by a mess. So uh, the, the my first answer would be yes and no, meaning that if we're talking about, you know, can anybody give a foundational kind of, a, of, of answer to why is it that you think that we know this? So in other words, can you give me the, the rock bottom uh, uh, foundations on the basis of which you're building 
uh, all of uh, scientific knowledge and rational knowledge and logical knowledge, mathematical knowledge, and so on and so forth, I would have to say no. That would be that's something that Descartes showed us cannot be done. Right. Essentially. Right. Now, does that bother me to the point of becoming essentially an epistemic relativist? You know, to say, well, therefore, any any bit of reasoning or any bit of evidence uh, counts as the same. No, I don't. I, don't, I definitely don't want to go that far. Uh, would you? Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I there is. I do view myself as as belonging to a type of position that is anti-rationalist in the small r sense uh -huh. of thinking uh, that, that, in a sense, the lesson I take from skepticism is that we're far much less rational than we like to think we are. We're far less rational than philosophy likes to think we are. Yeah. Um, and um, and that we have to take a lot more without rational justification than, than, than philosophy would like to think um, in order to get any of our what we call epistemic endeavors going. Um, um, so in that sense, you know, I read Hume as a naturalist. Yeah. I read Hume through the lens of Norman Ken Smith, um, who I'll provide links to that the Stanford Encyclopedia will explain what that means. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also through the lens, frankly, of the later Wittgenstein. Um, um, uh, and so and so I, I get, you know, I know that you've expressed, you know, we've had this conversation in some of your Scientia discussion, uh, discussions on your webzine. Um, maybe you might want to say something about it. You appeal, you've appealed to what's called the Quinean web of belief. Right. Yes. As somehow providing some kind of, if not solution to skepticism, at least a reason for thinking that our beliefs are are, are well warranted without foundation. Well, and maybe maybe you could say something about that. Yeah, little. sure. So so uh, um, on the one hand, uh, first of all, let me agree with you on one thing, which is yes, I think that Hume should be read in a sort of a naturalistic, uh, from a naturalistic perspective, and that definitely one of uh, Hume's messages, uh, or a major uh, med message from Hume, is that we should be much less confident about our rationality than uh, than perhaps. Not just philosophers in particular, but I think pretty much everybody, including scientists, that um, actually are. Um, that said, uh, I mentioned before the reason I, I mentioned in, in our disc one of our discussions at uh, over at Scientia Salon, I mentioned uh, Quine, uh, Quine's web of belief. It's not because I'm a particularly particularly a Quinean person. So uh, W. V. O. Quine, of course, we should rem remind the, the, our listeners. Uh, yes, please, please. Uh, you know, was one of the uh, most influential and most controversial philosophers uh, uh, of the 20th century. Uh, he, he wrote about epistemology, philosophy of science. Um, and he was very much a self-described nat naturalist. There's, you know, he, he, he went so far, for instance, as saying that epistemology, uh, which in <coughs> philosophy is, of course, the study of, of, of knowledge, of uh, knowledge claims, uh, that epistemology should become essentially a branch of uh, psychology. Uh, I don't go that far. I, I don't. I think that epistemology ought to retain an independence uh, from uh, from psychology, even though uh, epistemologists better take on board what cognitive scientists discover about how the human mind works and how especially how it makes you know mistakes and and, and, and fails so before going back to the to the uh, the web of beliefs uh one of the classic examples of this is you know in in every uh critical thinking book or almost every critical thinking book at the college level that you that you pick up you will see the standard list of you know uh uh fallacies both of uh, formal fallacies and informal fallacies. Now, the formal fallacies mm -hmm. are fallacies in sort of deductive logic, and there are very few of those, and they're very well understood. The informal fallacies, as it turns out, are a little bit more of a mess. Uh, these are things yeah. like, you know, the ad dominum. So you, you know, you, you're making essentially attacking the character of an individual as opposed to uh, his arguments, or uh, or the genetic fallacy, which is a sort of a variation of the same idea. So you're dismissing a notion because of where it comes from, as opposed of, uh, to its own merits. So you, you say things like. Oh well, he's a creationist. Of course, he doesn't believe in evolution. Well, yeah, but just because he's he's a creationist, that doesn't mean he doesn't have a good argument uh, that you shouldn't, uh, you know, take on on its own merits and so on and so forth. There's a bunch of of, of these, right? Now, um, uh, or one of my favorites actually is the, the uh, uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc, the idea that yeah. uh, if something follows temporally something else, therefore the the first thing probably caused the second thing. Now. The logical, the informal logical fallacies are very interesting because, first of all, as it turns out, I looked into this recently because I'm uh, with a co-author of mine, a couple of co-authors of mine, um, 
I'm actually about to publish a paper on uh, logical fall on informal logical fallacies, and um, there is a, an interesting literature there, which seems to sort of going in the direction of the fact that there is no such a thing as an informal fallacy, meaning that um, it's not actually bad reasoning. It depends on the context. Like, let me give you the example of the sort of the genetic fallacy, right? If I say that I'm going to dis in general, I'm going to dismiss an argument just because. I have suspicions about the source. Um, it's said like that. It's kind of vague. It depends on the specifics. If, for instance, the argument is uh, this is a wonderful car that I'm about to sell you for 500 bucks, and the argument, the, the, the person making the argument is a very well-known uh, uh, car dealer who has been engaging in fraud f throughout his career. I, I, I think there is a pretty good reason to be skeptical of that sort right. of thing. Right, that's not a fallacy. Exactly. That's not a fallacy. Exactly, right? it's not fallacious <laughs> anymore. I mean, you'd you be kind of stupid not to, uh, you know, be suspicious of that sort of thing. So, uh, the reason I'm bringing that up is because uh, we know that in critical thinking textbooks, uh, 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 the the recent trend has been not only to study these logic, so-called logical fallacies, from a sort of a logical perspective, from the perspective of of the logic of, of induction and inference, but also from the point of view of psychology. Uh, as it turns out, there is a pretty good match actually between uh, informal logical fallacies and uh, uh, cognitive behaviors, uh, cognitive uh, sort of um, uh, mistakes that we all make about about reasoning. So. You cannot really do epistemology in any interesting sense, I think, unless you do take on board uh, sort of psychology and cognitive, cognitive science. Uh, but that, that, but I wouldn't go as far as Quine did to say that. Therefore, we should, you know, close shop in epistemology and just move over to the psychology department. That was a long prologue to just uh, make the point that I'm not a wholesale Quinean uh, in my in my positions. Nonetheless, I do like the idea of a web of knowledge uh, as a metaphor. I mean, remember, that, you know, obviously, let's let's remind ourselves that these are all metaphors, right? The foundation, uh, uh, when, when somebody is a foundationalist, uh, that, that's a metaphor as well, right? We're, we're looking at sort of lo at knowledge as if it were a building, that you, you put the foundations first right. and then you start building the upper floors. And of course, as we all know, uh, from basic, uh, you know, engineering 101, if the foundations are not good, eventually the whole thing is going to crumble down. Um, in the web of knowledge metaphor, it uh, tries to escape that kind of image and say, look, we know, we know because of people, precisely because of the skeptics, uh, precisely because of people like Descartes and Hume, we know that the foundational, uh, any foundational project is, is bound to fail. It's, it's just not going to work. Uh, there is right. no such because, thing because there are no there are no absolute certainties right. that can support all the rest of the things we exactly. Right. Now right. that said, then you know, so what are we going to do? Give up the whole thing and and you know shop and, and close close down and go home for for a vacation? No, what we're doing is you know, <laughs> <laughs> we 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 yeah. re, we reach out to some kind of different metaphor and it, uh, mindful of course that metaphors are as uh, you know again just analogies and therefore they they have their own limits. But I think that the the, the web metaphor is interesting in, in this respect. First of all, the basic idea, as you know, uh, is that our beliefs are interconnected uh, like a web, like a spider web. And, and uh, uh, more interestingly, that some of these um, threads on the web are, are much thicker than others. Um, that uh, some of these threads can be replaced, uh, for instance, without having the whole web collapsing. That's the that's one major difference with the foundational metaphor, right? Uh, with the idea that you can work just like a spider, you can work on the web uh, and rebuild it and and destroy certain parts and rearrange them without the whole thing collapsing, which you wouldn't be able to do with a building. You know, you can't take the, the foundations out and then say, yeah, right. I'm gonna start right. over. Um, right. So that one is is appealing. The the point the point being the point being that you can revise even some pretty fundamental beliefs right. without the whole thing collapsing. Right. And um, although although it may cause the relations between the other beliefs to reorient, that's right. right? I mean, it may yeah, yeah that's go right. On. So it's a, which is why, by, by the way, er, early on in this in this conversation, I mentioned the the words uh, uh, reflective equilibrium, right? So I, I see the pursuit of knowledge as a constant exercise in reflective equilibrium, where the idea is that at any time uh, you have you have a, a dynamic equilibrium about your notions your, uh, about the world. You think you know certain things, but that equilibrium is always open to 
uh, change, to challenge, you reflect on the challenge, you think, okay, there's this new information coming in, so I'm going to change certain parts of the web. The other thing right. that I do like about the, uh, the metaphor of, of a web is that, of course, the web at some point has to attach somewhere, right? It doesn't float in midair. Even, even though it, it's not like a foundation, it still has to be attached somewhere. The difference being, of course, that it can be attached at several different places simultaneously so that you can remove even one of the attachments and still the whole thing might not collapse. Now, what are these attachments? Uh, for Quine, these attachments are the kinds of things about which we feel more confident. And these are, you know, basic, for instance, empirical knowledge about the world coming from our senses or basic uh, issues, you know, basic notions in logic or basic notions in, in mathematics. It's not the idea. It's not. I take it. At least that's my interpretation. It's not that those are foundation, that those cannot be touched. Even those can be touched. In fact, Quine is very explicit. He says, you know, if, if at some point it turns out that we have to change or, or throw out uh, some of the laws of logic, so be it. You know, it's, there's nothing sacred, including logic itself. But of course, those are much bigger targets. Those are much bigger parts of, you know, threads in the web. So you better have really, really solid reasons before you throw them out. Um, and I like what I like about the metaphor is this idea that it's dynamic, this idea that although there are important more more and less important parts of our of our web of beliefs, uh, so not all beliefs in, in our words are created equal, which would be the position of the so sort of the relativist. Uh, the whole thing is up for discussion, and it can constantly be uh, reworked uh, in order for us to navigate the world. Because then, after all, uh, in that sense, Quine was very much a pragmatist. Uh, you know, what's the point of this whole thing? Well, we want to navigate the world. We want to understand the world at our, at our best. And, and of course, we cannot do it, uh, as you pointed out uh, minutes ago. Uh, we cannot do it from a completely skeptical perspective, because if we really acted as skeptics, when we wouldn't get up from bed, uh, of bed in the morning, because we wouldn't know that there is yeah. a bed anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we're not, we, we shouldn't um, get into sort of details of Quine exegesis. Probably not. <laughs> um, 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 I, I will say that I do, th that in terms of, of terms of the web of belief as Quine describes it in uh, the paper, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, which is where he introduces right. it. Um, he does state that um, while most of the beliefs in the web are justified by these interconnectedness, interconnectednesses, that is, that um, that it's basically they're, they're they're justified by appeals to consistency with the other beliefs within the right. system, um, that the beliefs at the periphery of the web are justified observationally. Yeah, right. That is that is he makes a distinction between observational beliefs and all the rest, and what he says is the beliefs that are all the way at the middle, which are the beliefs like in logic and mathematics, would require such massive observational disconfirmation across the whole of the outside that it's very unlikely to happen and that's why they have the appearance of being the set of, of, of being necessary right. even though they're really not um, but my the reason why I always think that Quine is really no answer to skepticism at all is because first of all he does ultimately have to appeal to observational beliefs sure. And those are going to fall right into the sort of the Cartesian sure. arguments. Um, um, and the reason he has to, here's the thing, the reason he has to appeal to observational beliefs is because otherwise complete fictions can be internally consistent. In other words, I can write a completely fictional novel about a fictional universe. Internally, all the propositions are consistent. But if there are, none of the propositions are confirmed or disconfirmed by appeal to observational experience, then it has no connection to the to reality, right? right? Yeah. You, you, there's no reason to think it's... In other words, the, 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 the purely coherence view of justification has a truth problem. Yeah. So right? you, you, read, you, had, you read Harry Potter as well. Oh. That's right. You, you, yeah, yeah, you, can, yeah. you can build an yeah. entire fictional universe. But, but I, and I, I see your points. Uh, my, my two brief comments, because I think we're getting close to the end of this conversation, but, but my, my yes, two uh, brief comments about what you just said are, 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 are the following. So first of all, I don't take the, the Quinean web of belief as a, a response to a skeptical challenge necessarily, but as a, a better alternative to a foundational model of epistemology, yeah, right? I so it's a, it's a more limited yeah. sort of uh, kind of approach than, I, I, as I said it earlier, I don't think there is an answer to the skeptical challenge. Uh, the second thing is, it's true, of course, that uh, broadly speaking, the web of knowledge 
uh, metaphor is foundation. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't use the word foundationally. <laughs> is uh, is in fact a type of coherentism, right? It's it's a it's a, an appeal yeah. to coherence. But because that coherence includes empirical information, it's not just logical coherence. In other words, it's not like so. It excludes Harry yes. Potter, right? So if you were if you were to say, well, look, uh, my my description of uh, of Harry Potter's world is just as good as the description of you know. Uh, of a CNN reportage on the Iraq war. Well, all right, that probably was a bad, a bad, bad example. But anyway, um, given the quality of CNN reportage. But, <laughs> uh, but if, it were, you were to make, if somebody were to make that argument, I could say, well, wait a minute. Uh, we do not have actual empirical you know, observational access to anything like a Harry Potter world. We do have empirical observational access to something like, you know, the Iraq world and so on and so on and so forth. Now, that doesn't solve at all the, the skeptical issue, but it does make the Quanian view of a web of knowledge something, in my mind, interesting uh, as a, uh, a combination, really, of a, uh, of, of a coherentist view of truth and, and sort of a correspondence with reality as much as we can ascertain it. Uh, view, or at the very least, a more sophisticated, coherentist view than than your your uh, basic variety, garden variety. Yeah, yeah. So, just in conclusion, let me just let me just say, um, you know, the the way the way I looked, I actually do think that there isn't there's not a solution to skepticism, but I think there's a dissolution of skepticism. Okay. I th I think I th you know in that sense I, you know I accept you know, what, what Hume would call a skeptical solution, right? right. Um, um, uh, and that is a solution that accepts the skeptical challenge, but somehow says that it's somewhat beside the point. Um, I generally, the, the way I look at this is that, is that, look, um, what we have to learn from the skepticism is the same thing the skeptic has to learn. And that is that there's a fundamental mistake we can make about justifications, about rational warrants. Yeah. Um, they don't go all the way down. Right. Right? Exactly. Um, 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 so the idea that, you know, it's one thing to say we can rationally justify a belief and that this belief is better than that one because this belief has a good reason and this one doesn't. Right. It's another thing to say that all your beliefs can be shown to be warranted, that the entire system can believe a belief can be warranted. Yeah. And that's what I think is not possible. Yeah. And so I think the skeptic fundamentally makes a mistake and that the skeptic demands of us a justification for the entire system of belief when that's not possible. All that we can do is we can justify uh, one belief as opposed to another. And the reason for that is, is that in order to justify anything, we already have to believe a whole bunch of things. Yeah. Um, we have to believe in the principles of justification. We have to believe that our senses yep. work. We have to believe. And so at the end of the day, um, justification only gets start, started once a whole bunch of beliefs are already yeah. in place. Um, now, Hume says that that's a product of nature, um, that we naturally believe these fundamental things, and then we can start reasoning afterwards. Wittgenstein says it's more a matter of the logic of how uh, frames of reference work. Sure. Um, 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 that you know, if you have if you have if you have something that operates within a frame, you obviously can't justify the frame. Right. <laughs> um, and I think either way of these, uh, uh, either way, either way of these lo way, uh, looking at it is useful because it it, 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 it disabuses us of a very easy error. That I agree. Have. And in fact, I would go even further. Uh, wait, damn it! I know, right? Wait, wait a minute. This was supposed <laughs> to be episode in which we disagree. So I, I would go even further and actually say that the the the. The way in which Hume and Wittgenstein uh, look at it are, are actually not at all mutually exclusive uh, or in any conflict. No. I mean, you can read Hume, of course, Hume wrote before Darwin, but you can read Hume as giving a naturalistic, today we will say an evolutionary account of, yes, of things. Yes. You know, this is, you know, we have this way of thinking because we evolved naturally to, to navigate problems in, in the real world, and that's how we do it. That's the way we do it. Uh, Wittgenstein's take uh, tells you uh, how we think about these things in a modern society, in a sophisticated society, after the invention of language and so on and so forth. I mean, after all, it was big yeah, about language, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So I, I don't see those as exclusive, and I actually think that they're both very, very good, very valid uh, reminders, you know, ways of looking at, at, at this issue. Look, it's not really different from, let's say, even mathematics itself or logic itself, right? The, the, we, we think of, of mathematics 
uh, mistakenly, as it, as it turns out. But we think of mathematics, often people think of mathematics as just, so the quintessential example of absolute certainty, you know, certain knowledge. Yeah. But even, even without getting into uh, all of the issues that you know, a lot of mathematical conjectures cannot actually be proven and they need to be explored by induction, which is a whole it, 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 interesting issue in and of itself. But even when you can prove a mathematical conjecture, even when you can give a rigorous uh, deductive proof of a mathematical conjecture, you first of all, you are going to assume that deductive reasoning is, in fact, uh, the way to go. Uh, you also have to start with certain axioms. And, you know, yeah, which are based on nothing right, but intuition. Exactly, which are based on intuitions <laughs> or the fact that, you know, it turns out that they work, they provide some interesting results or, or the applicability, yeah. and that's it. You don't have any further justification for the axioms themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess we've managed to, we're going to annoy everyone again. <laughs> um, but maybe this is just how smart people think. Ah, you know? yes, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for doing this again. And it was um, a pleasure. I look forward to the Absolutely. next one. <laughs> All right, take care, you Massimo. Bye-bye. Yeah.